It's 1974, and the story of a single Japanese soldier still fighting a war that had been over for nearly 30 years on a lone island in the Philippines was making headlines in Japan. Fascinated by this story, adventurer Norio Suzuki decides to embark on a daring journey to find the long-lost soldier and bring him back home. The man's name is Lieutenant Hiru Onoda, an intelligence officer with the Imperial Japanese Army who had been sent to Lubang Island in 1944 to stop an Allied invasion. The lieutenant had been missing since the war ended in 1945 and had been declared dead in 1959. So buckle up as we take a deep dive into the journey of a man who fought for nearly 30 years after World War II had ended. Hiru Onoda was born on the 19th of March, 1922, in Kamakawa, Wakayama Prefecture, in the Empire of Japan. Onoda spent most of his childhood in the Kansai region of Honshu before working as a salesperson for a Japanese company operating in China in 1939. However, the universe had a different plan for him. Everything changed in 1941, when the Japanese Imperial Army attacked the United States Naval Base of Pearl Harbor. This catastrophic event led to the U.S. declaring war on Japan, stirring up a conflict between the two nations. As a result, all able-bodied men in Japan were drafted into the army. Therefore, in 1942, 20-year-old Hiru Onoda was conscripted into the Imperial Japanese Army and was subsequently chosen to train as an intelligence officer. Onoda was also trained in guerrilla warfare learning the skills that would later enable him to survive in the jungle for so many years. As the course of the war began to turn against Japan, it was decided in December 1944 that Lieutenant Onoda's skills would be best utilized in the Philippines. Therefore, Onoda was sent to lead a guerrilla warfare operation in Lubang Island in the Japanese-occupied Philippines. His orders were clear and simple to destroy the island's airstrip and pier at its harbors as well as to destroy any enemy planes or boats that attempted to land. Onoda's orders further stated that, under no circumstances was he to surrender to the enemy or take his own life. It was a huge responsibility, one that Onoda was committed to undertake. Unfortunately, when he arrived in Lubang, Onoda joined forces with a group of Japanese soldiers who had been sent there previously. The officers in the group outranked Onoda and they prevented him from carrying out his orders, as they argued that they would need those harbors and airstrips to evacuate their men. Following this, on February 28, 1945, American soldiers had an easy landing in Lubang, and in the battle that ensued, American forces overwhelmed the Japanese troops. It wasn't long before most of the Japanese soldiers defending the island had either been killed, captured, or managed to escape. As the American invasion escalated, Onoda received a battlefield promotion to a full-fledged second lieutenant. Then he received orders that would change his life forever. Major Taniguchi told Onoda, he must stand and fight and never surrender. It may take three years, it may take five, but whatever happens, we will come back for you. As a young lieutenant given direct orders from a general, these words were engraved into Onoda's mind, and he swore an oath to fight the war till the bitter end. To protect his men, Onoda ordered a retreat into the mountains, changing their strategy to that of guerrilla warfare, and began to put to good use all the survival skills he had learned during his training. The men continued to carry out guerrilla warfare against the American forces through 1945. After a short time, all but Second Lieutenant Onoda and three other soldiers Private Yuichi Akatsu, Corporal Shoichi Shimada, and Private Kinshichi Kazuka had already died or surrendered. While in the dense, jungle-thick mountains, these men were completely cut off from Central Military Command and were unaware that Japan had surrendered on the 15th of August 1945, following the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Orders were delivered through Central Command, passing on that Japan had surrendered and all soldiers were to stand down. While in hiding, Onoda and his men continued their mission carrying out guerrilla activities, surviving on bananas, coconuts, and stolen rice and cows, and on several occasions engaged in shootouts with locals and the police. They successfully evaded American and Filipino search parties and attacked villagers whom they believed to be their enemies. 
The first time Onoda's group saw a leaflet announcing that Japan had surrendered was in October 1945. They had found a note left behind by the islanders that read, The war ended on 15th August. Come down from the mountains. The men concluded that the leaflets were Allied propaganda and believed that they would not have been fired at if the war indeed had ended. As the year came to an end, leaflets with a surrender order from General Tomoyuki Yamashita of the Japanese 14th Area Army were dropped by air on the island. Onoda's group studied the leaflets closely to determine whether it was genuine, and they decided it was not. Increasingly suspicious that the war might be over after all, Private Yuichi Akatsu decided to separate from the group in September 1949. He spent six months in the forest on his own, before surrendering to the Filipinos in 1950, and he was able to give the authorities some information about the group, which led to another airdrop in 1952, seven years after the war had ended, where letters from the three soldiers' families and family photos were dropped over the forest. At this point, you would think that these soldiers would be convinced by this compelling evidence, right? Nope. They again dismissed them as a trick from the enemy. In the following year, Private Shimada was wounded in the leg following a shootout with the local fishermen. Onoda was able to nurse his injured comrade back to health. Unfortunately, it was all for nothing as Private Shimada was shot to death following a shootout with the Philippine Army Mountain Unit who accidentally encountered the soldiers while training. Although the shooting was accidental, the two soldiers saw it as the enemy closing in, fueling them further into their wartime delusion. After Shimada's untimely demise, every conceivable tactic was utilized in the quest to persuade the two remaining soldiers to come out of hiding. One 1959 search party left behind up-to-date Japanese newspapers and magazines. Onoda picked up the newspaper and, unable to make much sense of the world so different from the one with which he had last been in contact with 15 years ago, dismissed it as fake news. Finally, with no new sight of the pair, they were officially declared dead back home in Japan. As the 1960s gave away to the 1970s, the increasingly ragged soldiers carried on their war despite the unbearable conditions in the jungle, determined to carry out orders given to them nearly 25 years ago. In a heartbreaking turn of events, in October 1972, Private Kazuka was killed in a shootout with local police while conducting a raid in which he and Onoda burned piles of rice harvested by the villagers, which they intended as a signal to Japanese forces that the group was still alive and carrying out their duties. When the news of Private Kazuka's death reached Japan, speculation mounted as to whether Onoda might still be alive. By 1974, the story of a single Japanese soldier still fighting a war that had been over for nearly 30 years was big news back in Japan. Bored with his life in Japan, adventurer Norio Suzuki had become fascinated with the story. He decided he wanted to track down Onoda to see if he was actually still alive. He made his way to Lubang Island and began his search. Suzuki tracked him down in a matter of days, and on the 20th of February 1974, he found him. Onoda was fully prepared to shoot Suzuki on sight. Luckily, Suzuki had done his research on the soldier and quickly said, Onoda-san, the emperor, and the people of Japan are worried about you. It was enough for Onoda to lower his weapon and listen to Suzuki. The war had been over for nearly 30 years, Suzuki told him. It was time to come home. As you already might have guessed, this had no impact on Onoda whatsoever. Onoda refused to surrender explaining that he was still waiting for orders from his commanding officer. Suzuki headed back to Japan with a photo of Onoda and himself as proof that the long-lost soldier was indeed still alive. Once the authorities received the news, a search began to track down the man who had given Onoda the orders to never surrender. By 1974, Major Taniguchi was living the quiet life of a bookseller. He was equally surprised when the Japanese government asked him to fly to the Philippines so he could relieve a soldier he hadn't seen in three decades of his duties. On March 9, 1974, Taniguchi arrived in Lubang and read the following statement to Onoda. The Imperial Command has ceased operations. The 14th Area Army has dissolved. You are hereby ordered to stop all military activities. Iru Onoda still wearing his tattered uniform and carrying his rifle. Formally surrendered on March 10, 1974, he handed over his functioning Arasaka Type 99 rifle. 
500 rounds of ammunition, several hand grenades, and a dagger given to him by his mother in 1944 for suicide if he was captured. He then boarded a plane to Manila where he presented his sword to the Philippines president, Ferdinand Marcos. Marcos accepted the soldier's surrender and formally pardoned him for the crimes he committed while in hiding. For Lieutenant Hiru Onoda, the war was finally over. Onoda was enthusiastically welcomed home upon his return to Japan in March 1974 and became a huge celebrity, publishing his memoir only a few months later. The Japanese government offered him a large sum of money in back pay, which he refused. When money was pressed on him by well-wishers, he donated it to Yasukuni Shrine. After spending nearly three decades in the wilderness, Onoda had a great difficulty adjusting to the life back home, particularly as life in modern Japan bore little resemblance to that experienced in the more traditional imperial Japan of the pre-World War II era. Just a year after returning home, in 1975, he moved to Brazil, where he became a successful cattle rancher, living quietly and away from the public eye. While in Brazil, he also married a Japanese teacher. Later in 1984, he returned to Japan and together with his wife established the Onoda Nature School, an educational camp for troubled children. Onoda lived out the rest of his life a rich and successful man. Onoda died on the 16th of January 2014 at the age of 91. His story remains one of the most extraordinary examples of loyalty and sense of duty. Do you think Onoda's choice to fight the war that long was dedication? Or was he completely out of his mind? Let me know in the comments. As always, thanks for watching.